welcome to the May Economic and RBA update. In today's show, we're talking all about, well, really the only thing that matters at the moment, and that's inflation. We're also going to take a deep dive into the Australian economy and the evolving inflation story that we've got going on here, which is really domestic demand. And then in the property update, we're going to focus in on the latest market results. And then CoreLogic also released uh, a report yesterday talking about how rents are at the highest level that they are in the history of rental property. So we're going to take a deep dive and have a look at rents in the property section. Now, joining me today, as always, is Evan Lucas. Welcome to the Economic and RBA Update, Evan. Hello, Ben. How are you? Thank you for having me. You're right. I'm glad we're realistically concentrating on, on what's going to matter to you guys out there, which is particularly Australia. And I really want to highlight something before we go any further, because I need to put my hand up and say very clearly that when the facts change, so does my opinions. And the facts have changed. And I'm going to admit straight off the bat that what we presented you know, two of these ago is going to be wrong. And I know it's going to be wrong. And we want to go through today to explain why we're wrong and what has changed to make our changes in our minds and also in our outlooks with regards to, to not just inflation and employment, but rates, what the global economy is going to look like. And that's why Ben and I are going to really go through in a really deep dive the US and Australia. So that's what I want to sort of start with is being aware that unfortunately things have changed and why they've changed and how we're going to deal with them. Now, that's a beautiful segue to actually start off in looking at what's happening globally. So we'll start with the US where we normally do. And we saw the US Bureau of Economic Analysis. They released the US economy that expanded annualized at 1.6% in Q1 of 2024. Now that was compared to a 3.4% result in the previous quarter. And it was below forecast estimates of 2.5%. Yeah. Now, this was the lowest growth since the contraction in the first half of 2022. Now, in annual GDP terms, the US expanded by 3%, which is down from the 3.1% annual result that we saw in the December quarter. Uh, and also, a slowdown is seen in consumer spending. So let's have a look at where those slowdowns occurred. So consumer spending, 2.5 versus 3.3, mainly due to a fall in consumer goods, which was negative 0.4 for the quarter versus 3% for the last quarter. While spending on services, and this is where, where we're talking about it, rose faster at 4% versus 3.4%. Now, rounding out the data, we saw non-residential investment also eased 2.9 versus 3.7. This was due to con due to structures, which was down negative 0.1 of 1% versus 10.9% in the last quarter. Investment in equipment rebounded 2.1 versus negative 1.1 and intellectual property products accelerated 4.5% versus 4.3, thanks to the world of AI. Uh, we yeah, saw yeah. government spending rose um, way less, 1.2% versus 4.6 in the last quarter. Exports slowed sharply, 0.9% of 1% versus 5.1% in the previous quarter, whereas imports rose strongly. They soared at 7.2% versus 2.7%. And then finally, we saw a residential investment jump at a double-digit pace of 13.9 versus 2.9%. So some interesting numbers in there, Evan, in terms of what we're seeing quarter by quarter. Yeah, and what the theme already you can hear from the US numbers, it's going to be the same for us here in Australia, is that the story is so cluttered. There's so much going on. And mm. you know the term I'm going to use over and over in this talk is you know, it's a box of chocolates numbers. And you can hear in what Ben just outlaid is that things like essentials, they're still doing reasonable discretionary items are going backwards. It also, depending on who you want or what you want to listen to, will tell you that this is, you know, an okay story. Some will tell you it's not. And I, and I think that also is what I'm going to start with here is there is an argument on the sort of more bearish side that what we've just got in the US is the start of stagflation. And we're going to come to the inflation numbers in a minute. But having growth at 1.6%, is so far below where they needed to be that the path that the Federal Reserve is trying to operate on, which is contain growth without crashing it, get inflation back and keep employment going, is getting very, very narrow. And that is very clear from those numbers. And a growth number at that level for the US is too far below what they need to do. And this is the conundrum that the Federal Reserve, also the federal government, are facing. I think the other thing to really be aware of here is how much seasonality is going on. So Ben highlighted particularly the numbers that are going on in things like residential areas. That is a seasonality number and it will even out. This is the first print because the US has about three prints of their GDP before they give you the final number. 
But overall, there's there's so much going in here to you know to unpack that it's very hard to get a proper read just on the GDP alone. So speaking of inflation, we saw the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what are we see in the data? Annual inflation rate in the US accelerated for the second straight month to 3.5% in the March data. Now, this is the highest readings in September compared to 3.2% in February and a forecast rate of 3.4%. So over every one of the, the trend lines that they were looking at. Energy costs rose 2.1% versus negative 1.9% in February, with gasoline increasing 1.3% versus negative 39 while utility gas services negative 3.2 versus negative 8.8 and fuel oil negative 3.4 versus negative 5.1 uh, fell less. So what we're talking about here is this whole energy transport sector um, is where we're seeing inflation being challenged over in the US. Now, we also saw inflation steady for food, 2.2% and shelter, 5.7%, but rose sharply for transportation. 10.7 versus 9.9, and the apparel reading was negative, sorry, it was 0.4 of 1% versus flat uh, in the last reading. Now, on the other hand, we saw price declines in new vehicles, negative 0.1% versus negative 0.4, and used cars and trucks, negative 2.2% versus negative 1.8. Now, compared to data of the previous months, the CPI rose 0.4 of 1%, the same as February, but above forecast of negative sorry, of 0.3 of 1%. Shelter gasoline contributed to over half of the monthly increases. Finally, in terms of annual core inflation was steady at 3.8%, and that was the same as the previous month and above forecast of 3.7. And the monthly core rate was also steady at 0.4, yet markets were expecting that to slow to 0.3. So this is an energy and household story. So it is really a story of the domestic inflation, isn't it, Evan? Yeah, and so that's what the board, so the, the Federal Reserve, that's what they picked up on in their March report. And why I say that is there was growing angst heading into their May meeting that happened last week that they could move away from their current projections of rate cuts in 2024. Because I want to highlight that at the start of the year, Ben and I were showing you their dot plots, which is their estimates of the board members themselves of where rates are going. The start of the year, it was 150 basis points put into it. So we're talking about over five. Now, clearly that was too much in terms of rate uh, rate cuts. It's now down just to 32 basis points. So 0.2, sorry, 3.2 of 1%. But on what Ben just highlighted and why I've just given you all that information, what they have said is that exactly that in the inflation story that has come out, particularly in the February and March numbers, is around the fluctuation that's going on in energy prices. But, and it is a but, core inflation is sort of getting stuck. And this is where the term sticky inflation kicks into. At 3.8%, you started to hear them say that they are getting a little bit concerned that they may not reach their target, and their target is 2%. So we're almost double where they need to be. And that's why expectations of rate cuts in the states have moved right out to the end of the year. And we just started to see, and this was Jay Powell's comments, that he's lost a little bit of confidence, just a little, a little bit of confidence that they can return to target inside their time frame. It makes things really interesting over in the US as well, because the current forecasting for that one rate cut this year now is in November. And that is also when we have the presidential election, something that Ben and I will talk to you about later in the year. But it's why this is fascinating, because clearly sticky inflation are things like insurance, rent, housing costs, health, education, things that you need. They are fixed costs to your lifestyle and to your life. They're the ones that are holding it. And I'm going to talk about this a lot in the Australian data as well. But the US is six months ahead of us, and it's showing that it's got it right down from where it was in 2022. And you can see that on the chart that Ben's got there. But, and it is a but, they're now starting to plateau out, and they're just getting worried that they may have not done enough yet to get it back to target. And that was the key takeout is, yes, it's an energy story, and therefore it could fluctuate down next month. But there's a core part of it that is still way too high for where they need it to be. Yeah, I think it's a good segue into what happened with interest rates at the last Fed Reserve meeting. And they did keep the Fed funds rate unchanged at 5.25 
to 5.5% at their last meeting. Now, that's the sixth consecutive time that rates have been on hold and this ongoing inflation pressure in a tighter labour market is stalling the progress for an easing cycle for interest rates in the US. We did hear from Jerome Powell stating he does not foresee a hike as likely and believes that the current policy settings are sufficiently restrictive enough to achieve their 2% inflation target over time. But that is really, you know, the sort of $64,000 question in terms of what's going to happen here in this particular space. And so now we've moved from what everyone was just saying, which was multiple rate cuts. And in some cases, some of those dot plots were forecasting as early as March, April of this year. That's not happening. We're pushing all, all of that all the way back until we can see that services inflation story move. So I think there's more to come when we're talking about what's going to happen in the US over the course of what, what you're referring to is an election year over there as well. All right, let's turn our attentions now to the employment story. Um, this one's an important one because this is the, the one that is you know quite a strong story for the US, which is similar to what we're seeing here in Australia. Now, we saw the US Bureau of Labor Statistics also report the unemployment rate in the US has edged up to 3.9% in April from a reading of 3.8% in March. Now, this surprised the market expectations as they had forecast the rate to remain unchanged. The number of unemployed individuals increased by 63,000 to 6.492 million, while employment levels went up by 25,000 to reach 161.491 million people employed in the US. Now, the labour force participation rate was unchanged at a reading of 62.7, and the employment population ratio decreased to 60.2 from 60.3 in the last reading. So we can see here that that actually, you know, losing that number of jobs is by design as they're trying to slow the economy down. So um, it, it is this mixed bag that we're seeing in the US or you you refer to as a, as a mixed box of chocolates there, mm -hmm. isn't it, Evan? Yeah, and so again, getting back to what the Fed told us at their May meeting, because you highlighted this before, you know, the, the original forecast for some people was March, but most people had what they referred to, not lift off, but actually the, the cut stating, was this month. May was the month that the consensus forecast was for to start the cycle of rate cuts. And we're clearly now away from that. But this is part of what they're suggesting is why they're not as you know hawkish as some people wanted. So that really strong view that maybe rate hikes are back on the table because there are signs that employment is slowing down. Again, I would much rather use the Bureau of Labor Statistics data than things like the ADP numbers, which which is the private numbers. Some people really jumped on that because it was really, really strong. And this idea that wages in the US is also starting to really take off, all of this spiring. Again, this is what I mean by the mixed chocolates. It depends on who you want to listen to, what data you want to collect, because it is noisy. It is loud. And the mm. Fed used that as their term. They used this lumpiness that's going to happen around inflation, this, you know, unstructured fall that we're going to have in the economy as the tightening takes place, hitting certain parts of the economy more than others, and therefore the time it takes to collectively move in the direction it wants to will be different because month on month it's going to obviously have volatility behind it. So this was their part of their other reasoning is that they're seeing signs that the employment data is starting to do what it wants. I know it's horrible to see people losing their jobs, but they do need to see that once you have – a slightly higher unemployment. It means there's less cash in the economy because people are now obviously not earning. They're therefore sitting on the cash they have and being quite frugal. So it, it's starting to show that it's working. But as I said, lumpy, whatever term you want to use, is there. And that's why, again, the Fed is holding off on the view that the next move will be a cut. They said that quite implicitly, but they are concerned that inflation just isn't moving as fast as they were hoping at this point in the cycle. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, that then plays into what we're going to talk about now, which is the consumer sentiment story. So, you know, where the expectation at the end of last year that we were going to see rate rise, rate cuts, I should say, we saw a nice little spike in the consumer sentiment data, but that's now also plateauing in yeah. terms of until whilst we have this uncertainty about where the economy is heading. So let's have a look at the University of Michigan numbers now. And we saw that they reported consumer sentiment for the US was revised lower to a reading of 77.2 in April from a preliminary reading of 77.9. And that compared to a 79.4 in March, which was the highest level since July 
of 2021. So we've seen this spike, but now it's plateauing. So both current conditions, which is one of the internal sub sub indexes, 79 versus 79.3 in the preliminary estimates, and expectations was 76 versus 77, declining from the initial expected results that they saw there. So meanwhile, when we also look at some of the other, you know, sort of indexes and the sub indexes, we saw inflation expectation for the year ahead was revised higher. Uh, to to 3.2% from 3.1, while the five-year outlook, and this is the interesting one for me, was confirmed at 3% when Mm -hmm. we know the Fed are trying to chase down a 2% target. So the consumer expectations, this says a lot about the consumer, doesn't it, in terms of they're sort of, they're saying we'll we'll be happy with a three. Well, that's not great in terms of long sustained economic growth. You want inflation to be as low as you can possibly get it where you get that balance right between economic momentum and growth, and that increases the living standards of people in there as opposed to diluting um, you know, their disposable income. So that's an interesting story that's developing in terms of, I think you know, everyone got ahead of themselves and now we're starting to see that inflation expectation really starting to play with sentiment. Yeah, and the concern with that expectation, I mean, the RBA used it here. It's a little bit different than the Fed. They haven't used the same term, but inflation psychology and why... The difference between 2% and 3% on a cumulative basis is huge. And, and, and let me highlight that. I, I was going to do this in the Australian section, but we should do it now because you've highlighted it perfectly, that if if the population starts accepting that 3% is fine, or here in Australia we're starting to accept 3.5% is fine, you need to put that into consideration. So let me put it to another way to you. If we take the dollar that you had in Australian dollars this is, in March 2020, so that quarter, to the cumulative effect of the inflation data we've just had in March 2024, that same dollar that you had in 2020 to buy exactly the same amount of stuff as we refer to it in 2024, you need $1.17. That's a 17% increase, cumulative, and that's about 4% is the average. If you were keep going at the current rate, which we've got obviously in the US, it's currently sitting at about 3.4. Here in Australia, it's sitting at around about 3.8 to 4%, depending on what you want to do. If you keep going on that, in the next two years, that $1 back in 2020, you're going to need $1.24 just to do the living standards you had back then. And that's the that's what Ben's alluding to here is that everything that you get from growing your own personal wealth, your wage, et cetera, gets completely diluted by the fact that inflation just erodes all that. And therefore, you're not growing, you're not getting ahead. That's the concern. That's the erosion, the purchasing power issue that comes with inflation and why it keeps central banks up all the time. It's what they have nightmares about and about trying to control it. And you can hear it in all of them at the moment. They're just having that nightmare. And that's the best way to say it to you is that the cumulative effect of inflation is starting to come home to roost. We cannot psychologically accept it as being fine. We have to get it lower. Yeah, and we'll talk more to that, obviously, in the deep dive in the Aussie data. So moving into, okay, so what's sentiment doing in terms of actual behaviour and action around spending? So we saw the the US Census Bureau release their retail sales in the US, which rose by 0.7 of 1% month over month in March. And that's following an upwardly revised 0.9 of 1% gain in February and a much higher than forecast 0.3, suggesting consumer spending remains robust. And that's got to do with the employment story. Mm -hmm. So as much as they're, you know, sort of a little bit sceptical, because they've got gainful employment, they're out there spending. So this is eight out of the last, sorry, eight of the 13 categories posted increases. So we're not seeing it showing up. So the Fed's got to be concerned about that powerful consumer in the US continuing to spend. So we saw major increases in sales of non-store retailers, gasoline stations, miscellaneous store retailers, building materials and garden equipment. There were gains also recorded in food and beverage stores, health and personal care stores, and food services and drinking places. On the other hand, they were down for sporting goods, hobbies, musical instruments, bookstores, clothing, electrical and appliances, general merchandise stores, autos and furniture. Now, excluding food and services, uh, sorry, food services, auto dealers, building material stores and gasoline stations, the so-called core retail sales, which are used as part of the calculation for GDP, jumped 1.1%. Now, we are seeing a trend in that data, aren't we, Evan, in terms of 
Like there is discretionary stuff that is being pulled back on. And of, co of course, you know, we have some essential spending there, which is around gasoline, which is fuel for cars and getting around and mobility. So we're seeing the right signals, but they're just not strong enough for us. Yeah. And so this is why at the moment there is so much interpretation to be had. But the data is showing one thing as a collective. And this is what the whole theme has been is that we know the right areas are coming down. We know that, you know, what would be described as almost theoretically true discretionary. So, you know, apparel spending, transport, you know, travel, restaurant stuff, that is moving in the right direction. But there are areas of spending that are great that we have to, you know, deal with that are discretionary that are still there. And then, yes, the essential items that we discussed before, they're still reasonable. But also, as you highlighted, we're starting to accept that's just part and parcel. So if that's just how life is, we're going to spend. And the States is a great example of that whole concept that they know that they need to slow down, and they are, but they don't want to give up everything in one foul swoop. And that's completely normal and completely natural as a human behaviour. It's completely natural in behavioural economics. But this is the catch between the hard, rational thought process of what the technical scenario should happen with rate rises versus the actuals that happen in real life. And again, we have seen similar things here in Australia as well, that sales pop up when they shouldn't, that you know the overall seasonality and employment's been better. And the US is basically replicating what we should expect to happen over the next six months. And we will come to our retail sales because you know if you look at the retail sales back in October, you look at also what happened here at the start of the year in January, those two big negative numbers are what we should expect but then you've also seen the population, again, accept it and get back to almost inverted commas, some form of normality and in seeing expansion in spending when it shouldn't be. Okay. So, you know, obviously that's very much a lag data indicator. We're seeing what's happening on the day to day. What we want to now look at is from the business's point of view. So let's do a, let's do a little bit of a snapshot in terms of what sort of behaviors are changing around business and what they're seeing in demand. So we saw from the Institute of Supply Management when we take a look at some of the business data, the IMS manufacturing PMI in the United States fell to a reading of 49.2 in April from a reading of 50.3. Now, remember, anything above 50 expansion tree, anything below 50 is contractory. Now, this was firmly below the market expectations for a stall. So this is actually a good news story in terms of businesses are starting to feel a little bit of the pinch in the manufacturing side. So the data reflected contraction in the US manufacturing sector, which failed to maintain early attraction that they got in the prior month. And it pointed to the first expansion in 16 months. Well, it was a bit of a false dawn. So what we did see was new orders move back to that contractory territory, 41.9 versus 54.1 in March. Pressure by lower demand for textile mills, food, beverage, tobacco, machinery and, and electronic goods industries had that contractory uh, component to it. Now, in terms of on the production was sustained and expanded in areas, you know, in terms of expansionary areas with a reading of 51.3 uh, versus a 54.6. And that was supported by the 19th straight decline in backlog of orders, which was 41, sorry, 45 Point four versus forty six point three. Now, consequently, um, in terms of lower demand for capacity, drove employment levels for manufacturing to drop for the seventh straight month. So here we are; we're starting to see that slowdown starting to show up. So we had a reading of forty eight point six versus forty seven point four in that employment level. And then finally, you know, for the worrying aspects of this data, which was the price index. Now this soared to a reading of 60.9. Now that points to the highest increase in input cost pressures since June of 2022. Now that lifted, you know, in, that was lifted by hikes in crude oil, aluminium, steel and plastic uh, prices. So all of those input costs, all of those, uh, you know, components that make up the finished product, they're really starting to also then flow through all on the back of, you know, higher energy and fuel costs. So it's, it, again, another mixed bag in terms of what we're seeing in the in the business data. Yeah, and again, that last part that you, you talked about there can be explained away. So it's import costs that come from the fluctuation and the volatility that comes in, particularly energy prices, so particularly around oil and gas. The overall story that I saw from the, you know, the ISM numbers is what the, the board wants to see. What the Fed wants to see is that businesses, as you said, are tightening, 
we've only had one expansion tree month in the last 16. So it is going in the right direction. The catch with it, and you highlighted it around price as well with the import costs, is it's not just in the US story, it's around the world. So you've got less supply of manufactured goods and demand, although it's falling, is still not falling as much as you were hoping. It is going to create an inflation scenario. It's just general economics and, and very simple supply and demand. So that's that's also feeding into this story is that collectively businesses around the world are tightening but demand is slowing but not at the same rate. So prices stay up. And this is the conundrum that we are not just facing in the States or here in Australia, it's across the world. And it's one that I'm watching quite closely because, again, people will and should be able to explain it away. But is this a reason also to keep rates higher for longer? That's all part of the question as well. Yeah, so, you know, quick summaries of the US market sort of tells us that, you know, this sticky inflation is hanging around, which is, you know, delaying potentially any rate cuts that might be happening in the US and and puts a rate hike potentially on the agenda, but a lower risk, uh, according to the Fed Reserve. So now, because we wanted to take a deep dive into the Australian market, what we're going to do for China is just do a couple of key takeaways and the same with the Eurozone. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on those markets because in theory, there's not a lot really to see there. So just some, some of the quick key takeaways out of the Chinese market, we saw GDP result was 1.6%. And it was a much improved result from the, the, the previous three quarters. Um, but in summary, the, the consumer is still pretty subdued. So spending patterns are still down, even though there was a festive season there. In terms of export trade is improving, but there's still a long way to go. So people are looking for other ways in which they can get you know, their goods made cheaper and imported uh, into their country. So China is a little, still a little bit challenged in that respect. And finally, the government is still realising that they've got a, a lot to do from a fiscal policy point of view to potentially drive some of that domestic demand as well as some of those money policy settings. So, you know, there is a lot of talk that we'll see uh, potentially an easing of some cash rates, especially around trying to get that property market stabilised and back in the black. Uh, the same is also going to occur for the Eurozone. So I want to quickly just talk to a couple of Eurozone messages, uh, points before I hand over to you, Evan. What we saw in the, in the Euro area, um, after two consecutive negative quarters, um, we did see a slightly positive quarter in GDP for Q1. So GDP rose by 0.3 of 1%. Uh, inflation, uh, importantly, is sitting in around that 2.4%. And core inflation is sitting at 2.7 cent, and that's down from 2.9 percent in March. So that does give you know the ECB some room to move, and the employment story uh, still sitting at around I think 6.5 percent unemployment rate there. Mm -hmm. So the consumer, you know, the employment story is okay, but the consumer and the business sentiment um, is still you know sort of spending, uh, you know, that spending patterns are still struggling, and so that means it's going to take a little bit of time for them to come out, and I think that's why the ECB are are looking to make a move, isn't it, Evan? It is. So I think that's a great point, Ben, in terms of what's going on with the ECB. I want to put the Eurozone, the UK, to some extent Canada, all in the answer to, to this as well, because we are going to get onto Australia and we really need to highlight on it. There is a clear difference between that part of the world, the US and Australia and the like. And why I say that is Ben just highlighted in the Eurozone, unemployment is much, much higher than it is here or in the US inflation's back into levels that are, are at target and economic growth, although it's starting to expand in some parts, it's pretty anemic in terms of where it sits. Mm -hmm. So Christine Lagarde has basically forecasted to the market that they are likely to cut rates in June. Now, be aware the ECB's rates overall are slightly higher than they are here in Australia, depending on which one you want to look at. But it's not just them. The Bank of England and the Bank of Canada are telling the same thing. So there are some parts of the world that will see cuts and they will be ahead of us. But, and it is a big but, there's reasons for that. They are struggling through the current economic conditions much, much worse than we are. We've got to remember, things are good. Like this is what I think is so hard to argue here, Ben, is what we're talking about is that all of this data is actually good data. But unfortunately, it means that we're going to have to deal with a scenario we don't like, which is higher rates. So, mm. you know, we're back to sort of terminology we were using in the mid 10s, which was, you know, good news is bad news and bad news is good news. It shouldn't be seen like that. The economy in Australia is doing great. But in the UK, in Europe, and to some extent, same with Canada, it's not as good as it needs to be. And so the one thing to be aware of is that they are likely to cut rates. 
and therefore there will be a lot of noise again around that. We need to concentrate on what matters to us, that's Australia, and the lead that we do get from the US, and that's why we've highlighted that quite strongly. So let's get into that, Ben. Let's get into Australia and do a really big, big dive. Yeah, well, here we go. So and normally by this time we'd probably go straight into the RBA announcement, but we're not going to do that because what we want to do is set a scene in terms of sort of what's what's been happening with the market, and then we can basically talk about what the governor and the board decided to do today. So we start where we started before for the other countries, and that is we're going to start with the inflation story. So we saw that the Australian Bureau of Statistics, they released, you know, the inflation read. And so I'm going to tell you the year-on-year -year story here. So the year-on-year -year story is a reading of 3.6% for, for Q1 of 2024. Now, that's down from 4.1% in the previous period, and that was above a market expectations of a 3.4% a uh, result. Now, this was the lowest figure since Q4 of 2021, as goods inflation eased for the sixth consecutive quarter, 3.1 versus 3.8 in Q4, and services inflation slowed for the third straight quarter, 4.3 versus 4.6. And we're going to come back to that one because it's mm -hmm. still that, that number in the fours is still too high. Yeah. So let's go through the breakdown in terms of some of those results so we can get some context. So inflation moderated for most components. So food, 3.8 versus 4.5. Alcohol and tobacco, 6.3 uh, versus 6.6. Housing, 4.9 versus 6.1. Health, 4.1 versus 5.1. Transportation, 3.6 versus 3.7. Communication, 1.8 versus 2.2. Recreation and culture, 0.2 of 1% versus 0.5. And insurance and financial services, 8.1 versus 8.2. So that is still too high in terms of that. Now, in terms of in the meantime, the cost of education accelerated. So that's 5.2 to, to 4.7. That's one of the ones that Evan was talking earlier about. Clothing rebounded, but only a small marginal 0.4 of 1% versus a, a disinflation of of 1.1% in the last reading. And furniture and household services was slightly up at 0.2% of 1% versus a flat reading before. Now, in terms of the RBA's trend mean CPI increased to 4% year on year. Now, this is the softest rise in two years, but remained outside of the central bank's target of the 2 to 3%, which is what we chase here in Australia. So if I can quickly summarise before I hand over, when you look at the, the annual year on year, you can see we put, you know, we peaked out at 7.8 and we're we're on our on our way down a slower way down so if you look at those numbers you're thinking what's there to see here but then you go and have a look at the quarter on quarter result and we were surprised by the march result so you can see there what it said you know in terms of that quarter by quarter basis inflation actually reaccelerated in that march quarter by 1% compared to the december quarter of 0.6 and the market had a reading, you know, they were hoping only for a reacceleration of around 0.8 on their forecast. So that is why um, the, the media had a field day uh, in terms of what's happening with interest rates in Australia. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Evan, and sort of just talk us through the way in which you look at inflation and some of the breakdowns in terms of what you're seeing there. Yeah, so this is why we wanted to do this deep dive, because it's super important to understand just how much and how big the dynamic actually is. And again, my term through this entire talk has been box of chocolates because as Ben's highlighted with this chart here, that reacceleration to 1% is an absolute headache for the RBA because why it matters and where it comes down to are things like this, tradables versus non-tradables. We keep hearing around this idea that this is a supply-led inflation story, that we have issues around you know, imported inflation coming from overseas, et cetera, and in and in there. The definition of tradables versus non-tradables, this needs to be pointed out very clearly. Tradables are anything, goods or services, that have input from international pricing. Non-tradables are those that don't. They're domestic-facing only products or services that we get here. So a good example, government and government spending and government increases things like health, things like education, things like rent. They are the things that are there. And this chart, what I wanted to show with you here, this is the six-month average of those. And you can see that actually international competitive inflation, tradables, it's contracting on an average of six months. That's a really good thing to know, that inflation in that spot, that had been a massive problem back in 2021, two and into 2023. We, we now, it's not this supply-led problem. 
it's a domestic story. And that's what the chart on the right is telling you is that actually, and you heard it in Ben's numbers when he read out, you know, you listen to things like financial services, you listen to things like education, like health. They're all sitting on average at about four and a half to as much as 6%. And that explains why the average over the last six months is at 5.77%. And if you even just look at it from the point of view of just on what goes on straight month on month, yes, it's starting to fall away. But it's still sitting at 5% in the last read for what we just had in March. And that grey band, as Ben highlighted before, that's where the RBA needs inflation to be at, 2 to 3%. Again, tradables last month are at 0.9 of 1%. So those services, those good providers that actually have to compete with international pricing, they're doing the right thing. They're back to levels that are much, much more sustainable. What this is telling me is it's us. We are still doing things in this country that are keeping inflation going and going at quite a rip. And we know that. That's where this term cost of living is coming into it because that's where it is. Non-tradables are the cost of living crisis we're face- facing and that's where that 5% is because we're our price takers as consumers. We have to accept the government charge we have to get. We have to accept the health price that we get. We have to unfortunately accept the rental or housing costs that we get. And this is the $64 million question as well, is how do you fix that? And we'll come to that in a minute. Because the final part of the story, again, is that you can split it all out, right? There's so many things going on inside of this. And this is another beautiful chart that came from IMF, which I thought was fantastic. So again, if you take the headline figure, but exclude housing, insurance, financial services, which are massive components of the inflation story, we're actually back in target. We're sitting at 2.5%. If you again take you know headline and take alcohol and tobacco out, or take um, education, all of them tell you that actually once you get rid of what's referred to as sticky inflation, that whole story, we're back inside target. Which is again why you keep hearing this discussion at the moment around why rate hikes could be possible, why rate cuts could be possible, because again it's all on this concept that on if you take certain parts of the inflation read, you can get a certain story. And it's why it's so messy and so noisy at the moment. Oh, I think you did a great job there, Evan, in terms of talking to that story. I mean, we've got to remember that the RBA's job of what they're trying to do is they're saying we, we are on a transition. We're not yes. going for a heavy, uh, you know, hard at it type of pull the brakes on and, you know, hit the skids. What we're trying to do or what they're trying to do is this narrow path, right? So this Goldilocks scenario, not too hot, not too cold, where they can retain as many jobs as possible. So I think that's got to be playing on their mind in terms of, because they know, obviously, you know, further cuts uh, is is going to have an impact on that. So they've got to then say to themselves, well, what's going to happen in housing? What's going to happen in insurances? What's going to happen in financial services? Those really difficult ones that are still moving up quite high in terms of, you know, will they in the next 12 to 18 months start to ease off as part of that particular story? So, With that in mind, uh, let's turn our attention to what the RBA and Governor uh, did today in terms of uh, Governor Bullock, and we saw she kept the rate on hold. So the RBA board decided to keep the rate on hold, and that's sort of off the back of, um, if you think about the minutes from the last board meeting, now we'll we'll get more, obviously she's doing a press conference now, and we'll have the the monetary statement um, as well. So we'll hear more about what their views are, but right now at this stage, there is a concern um, that rates are potentially, uh, you know, not not too hot, not too cold, and we'll just see how it's going to play out. So that is ultimately this narrow path, and that's why they've kept the rates on hold here. But in terms of tightening bias or easing bias, we're going to see how that plays out over the course of, you know, the statement and what and what she says during her press conference, which is happening right now. So for me, that's that's obviously, a, you know, an interesting thing. What I think about really is maintaining that employment story and what I was just saying, that narrow path, but also in terms of retail sales, mm-hmm. um, the economy is showing signs of slowing. Consumer sentiment is definitely in a very negative area, which we'll talk to in a minute. So that's, that's one of the sort of main themes that I'm seeing around just holding the line and just waiting for a little bit more data in terms of making their next call. How did you see the call today, Evan? Yeah, again, they keep giving themselves flexibility. So all of their language, and it's the same with the one that we saw in this, what we've just seen today, but also what we saw in their previous one, 
back in March is that the flexibility is still maintained. So they're still saying and talking about the concern around getting inflation back to target. They don't want inflation psychology to become absolutely rooted inside the population, and they are aware of that. They do point, again, to the global story that is two-speed, which is what we spoke about already in this talk, is the two-speed economy is there. They also talk about the China story still not really chugging along. So it gives them that ability, that flexibility to say, that's why we've kept rates on hold today. They're certainly still pointing to the idea and in their assumptions that, you know, future and looking into 25 and 26, that, you know, inflation will get back to target. They are a little bit concerned about the time frame, but overall, it's why they've sat on their hands today. Again, the only thing I sort of see mostly about this is, again, the flexibility term is there because they can also, therefore, argue into the future that if they were to raise rates, they had that sort of option in their last statement we've just seen today and what we're likely to hear from Michelle Bullock in her press conference right now. Okay, so let's see rolling in terms of the story behind, obviously, the decision today. And like we have been, let's unpack the employment story first. And we saw the ABS, our seasonally adjusted unemployment rate ticked higher to a reading of 3.8% in March from a February five-month low of 37 but below market forecast of 3.9%. The number of unemployed individuals increased by 20,600 to a reading of 569,900, whilst those seeking full-time jobs rising by 19,300 to a reading of 371,300, and those looking for part-time works added 1,300 uh, to a reading of 198,600. Meanwhile, employment unexpectedly fell 6,600 jobs uh, to a reading of 14.26 million, missing the market consensus of, of 7,200 gains. So that's, that's actually a good news when we're thinking about a slowing economy. In terms of part-time employment dropped by 34,500 to 4.41 million, while full-time employment increased by 27,900 to a reading of 9.85 million. Now, the other big uh, data points that we're going to talk to before I hand it over to you, we saw the participation rate of 66.6. That's down slightly from 66.7 in February. The underemployment rate came in at 6.5%, uh, 2.3 uh, 2 points lower than the level in March of 2020. Additionally, monthly hours in all jobs rose 17 million or 0.9 of 1% to 1.956 million. So there's a there's a little bit of a productivity improvement mm -hmm. story in the in the end of that data. So let's let's talk to the employment story, Evan, and uh, unpack what you're seeing. Yeah. So what I want to highlight again, we need to understand the employment story is a good story. It's a really positive thing. So this chart here that I've got on screen, if you listen to this on the podcast, is the participation rate versus the employment to population ratio. And I want to show you the reason I've got this is that the participation rate is at a record all-time high. More and more people are engaged with the market. More and more people are employed than ever before. That is a really, really positive thing. The other thing to sort of show here is that the employment ratio is holding up quite neatly, even with the migration story that we keep hearing about. So this is a really positive thing. And part and parcel of why that is, female employment is at a record all-time high. Female participation is at a record all-time high. There is an argument that this is a good and a bad thing. I'd argue it's straight out as a good thing. But why they say that is that because there's more and more people employed, there's more money into the household. And more money into the household is allowing you to have a much better lifestyle, absolutely, but it does also put more pressure into the system because there's more supply of money. So this is, this is the conundrum that everything's going on right now. And it's further to that as well, is that if you have a look at this chart, this chart actually shows, again, it's from the RBA. Ben's right, in the last month we saw productivity tick up, but this chart is concerning. And the reason it's concerning, this shows the employment growth versus total hours worked versus the average hours worked. And you can see that the total hours and average hours are falling and falling quite significantly. There's two ways to look at this. First and foremost, we're employed, that's great, but we're not working as much and for less time than we had before, which means we're seeing more and more of the gig economy pick up. We know that. It's also a productivity thing. 
If mm. we are that employed but are working less or working hours that are not as productive, we're starting to see a problem where, okay, yeah, we've got employment, but the productiveness of it is lower and the total hours worked is getting lower. The total return that that employee is putting out is getting lower. And then you couple that with this final chart, which is the wage price index. The wage price index is expanding at quite a clip. In fact, it's at the highest level it's been since back in 2007, just before the GFC, sitting at 4.2%. Now, it means, thankfully, that the population is actually finally seeing their wages above inflation, so you're not standing still. This isn't classified as a wage price spiral, but the speed at which it's moving is also a slight concern. Because if you go back to the idea, if we're working less hours, but our wages are going up, there's a productivity story to that as well, is that we're actually paying people more for less. And that's also just part of this whole pudding, chocolate, whatever analogy you want to use, <laughs> that we have this lots of disconnects with what's going on. So the employment market, from my point of view, it's great to see, but there are parts of it that is nice that it is socially to say we're getting a better return on our pay packet. There is a concern from the economics of it. And that's what the RBA is showing in these charts, that it's just seeing signs that make it a little bit concerned that we're being paid for less work, we're becoming less productive, and the pressure that, that also puts is part and parcel of the problem we're currently facing. Yeah, and I think, Evan, what it also shows is, you know, when we talk about inflation psychology and then we talk about wage spiral, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of wage price spiral, what if we accept the prices that businesses are offering us, then we turn around and we say to our employees, we want more money. Correct. And so, and then that is, that is when we do get into that wage price spiral. And so that's why the governor and the board will be very careful in terms of looking at these particular things. Because if we're not getting that productivity hit, then ultimately those businesses are going to have to pass on those costs in the prices that we pay at the checkout. Yep. And that is the problem. So and the other you know, flip side to that is that if the business can't, sooner or later, it's going to have to make the hard decision. And then yep. that unemployment decision becomes an interesting one. Because all of a sudden, if a business can't afford to employ people because of the wages they're asking, that's when you start getting mass unemployment. That's when you start to really rocket that up. And that's the all part of this dilemma at the moment. Everything's looking okay, but it can unravel very quickly if we get to this point that we accept, as Ben just pointed out, price increases for price increases, not for productivity increases. Now, that's Evan, how do we look Australia versus the, the US wage story? So what does that story look like in terms of the chart? Yeah. And so that's what the last chart to show you is, is that we are now joint with the US. So the US had a massive acceleration. And again, they're about six months ahead. And at one point, their wages were growing above 5.75%. They're now falling. And they're now sitting at 4.26. We're at 4.21. But we're still going up. They're coming down. And that's what this final thing to be aware of is, is that there is a real, real possibility that wages have peaked. The increases in wages probably peaked in the final quarter of last calendar year. And like the US, we're going to start seeing wages growth go backwards because it probably needs to. It cannot keep up with the current rate and the productivity we're putting out. And that's the final part of this puzzle. If we are using the US as a six-month barometer of what's going to happen here, we need to understand and probably accept wages are going to slow right down. Well, I think they either have to or productivity needs to lift. Something has got to give on either side of that equation because yeah. you're right, we can't, it's unsustainable at the way in which that economic you know, metrics are moving. Uh, something's got to give. Now, let's, let's move our attentions over to consumer sentiment. So if we're, obviously, if we're gainfully employed, what does it mean for in terms of how we're feeling about the broader economy and so forth? And we saw in the Westpac Corporation and Melbourne Institute data that the sentiment index fell to, uh, by 2.4% to a reading of 82.4 points in April. Now, that's a slide from the, uh, from the second consecutive month as persistent inflation and high interest rates continue to weigh on us. Now, before the latest inflation data, so this, this reading was before the latest infl inflation data, so there might be a, even a further spook that we might get in terms of what the, uh, what the results look like when we get the data out this month as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the index has been as fell below 100 for over two years, and this is the longest since the early 1990s recession. 
indicating that there is very persistent, um, you know, uh, and pessimism heavily outweighing optimism at the moment. So it is an, an interesting story. And then when we take a look at those sub indexes on the graph there, there's a couple that I've, you know, sort of just asterisks. The first one is family finances over the next 12 months. So you can see there that's gone back another negative 1.5 over the course of the uh, of the the month to month, and then over the the 12 months, it's sitting you know at 10%. So there really is a, a struggle going on there in terms of time to buy a major household item. We've seen you can see the long term average at say 124, and we're seeing that now currently sitting at 84.2. So that's gone down negative 2.9%. Uh, time to buy a dwelling. A long term average is 120.8. We're seeing that sitting at 77.8. Now that has moved up. And we expect that that had everything to do with people thinking that it was going to be interest rate uh, cuts. And so yeah. they're getting in before the crowds get in, uh, given the shortage of supply. So we did see that coming through as well. Um, unemployment uh, expectations index. This is the interesting one. People aren't worried about their jobs. Yeah. Like Long term average is 129. It's currently sitting at 128.1. So, you know, and that's up 1% one, uh, 1 in that time. So they're just not so worried about that. And then uh, in terms of house price, expectations index. Interestingly enough, long-term average 126.5. That's sitting at 161. Like that's extraordinary. Like, extraordinary. I, you know, like it's, it's, so, so everyone just thinks that house prices just keep going up and up and up and up. Yeah. Right? You know, the, the, it, and but look, that's the behavior that we do see out in the field as well, right? Where people are buying with their hearts, not necessarily with their heads. And we're seeing a bit of that happen as well. So I think at some point there, you know, it, that's going to have to work itself out in terms of whatever market it is, where it's the entry price point market, the mid-tier markets or the upper end of the market. Um, it's it's just quite fascinating in terms of how the perception out there that the property prices only go up and never go down. Yeah, and the disconnect also that I love to highlight in this table, which you've done beautifully, is the family finances and also the economic conditions. This is the same people that are forecasting that it's going to go backwards. It's an absolute yeah. dire situation but their unemployment expectations are ratchetly, rapidly higher than they should be. Because if you've got to worry about the economic conditions for the next 12 months, normally you'd be worried about your job because part of the economic conditions getting worse would mean higher unemployment and therefore you'd be nervous about your job. But we're not. This is the disconnect that the consumer has. This is a perfect explainer of the entire discussion we've just had through the last hour yeah. is that this is why the household is so interesting because – they're worried about their family finances and the economics, but have absolutely no concern that they're not—they're going to lose their job. Zero, and yeah. that's so strange because it's not how we should be thinking or feeling. And it partly explains again our behaviour, as you said, out in the real world. We're not worried we're going to lose our jobs, so we just keep spending, despite the fact that we know that things are having a cost of living crisis and that spending is supposed to be reined in, and that we've got a problem around interest rates. It's not marrying up with our behaviour because we don't have that fear of losing our job. Yeah, and then the recency bias in terms of looking mm. at that house price expectation. Yeah, that that is a classic case of well, I see it on the news and all I hear. I mean, you know, we have this love affair with property, and it, it definitely builds that momentum in terms of higher prices over the longer period of time. So, really, really good, interesting data. Let's see how that then correlates into. Uh, the consumer spending story. And we saw, you know, this has been the one that you know, I've been on for pretty much 12 months to sort of say, we've got to slow the consumer down. Um, but at this particular case, we're also now really, I think we're going to start, start talking about this over the next few months when we do these updates, we've got to s slow the government spending down. Yeah. Um, you know, now, now they're the problem in terms of spending too much. And I think there's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a chart shortly in terms of the spread of who's spending what. Um, and, you know, this the bubbles that we all live in in terms of whether we're doing our bit in terms of helping with getting inflation down. But let's have a look at what the, the ABS data suggested around retail sales. So retail sales dropped by another 0.4 uh, of 1% month on month in March, and that missed the estimates of a 0.2 uh, growth. So that's a, a you know good story in terms of the downwardly revised figure from February. Um, this is also the first decline in retail sales since last December as turnover fell in these industries. So let's quickly go through them. Clothing and footwear, negative 4.3% versus 4.9% in February. Department stores, negative 1.6 versus 2.3. Household goods, negative 1.4 versus negative 1. Other retailing, negative 0.3 of 1% versus negative 6. Cafes, restaurants and takeaway food, negative 0.2 versus plus 0.4 in February. 
Um, by contrast, food retailing rose by 0.9, a reversal from the fall of, of 0.2 previously. And throughout the year, uh, we've seen retail sales grew by 0.8, um, you know, which is the least since August of 2021. So remembering greater population, we've talked about this many, many a times. This is the sum of all of the moving parts. More employers, more population. Retail sales should be going up consistently all the time, but they're definitely below trend. And it's really clear in terms of people are being more conscious about where their spending is, but there's still more to do here. Yeah, and I'd agree. I would though, the final thing I would highlight this is almost a perfect mirror image of the US six months ago. Yeah. So if you have a look at what happened in October and November last year, they sorry, in January this year, they had two months of negative numbers exactly the same and almost at the same scale as this. So does that mean we're going to get a pop-up in April and a pop-up in May? Possible. I'm not sure it'll be that dramatic considering where we sit, but you highlighted straight out there, Ben, government spending. We do have, obviously, the federal budget next Tuesday, that will be a telling story about this figure as well because clearly part of the idea that if the government is going to come slightly to our rescue and provide us with cost of living assistance, spending can happen again. So watch that space as well. Which means inflation will stay high for long because businesses won't have to make the tough decisions that they need to do. Now, let's look at the next chart. And I love this. Thank you to the CBA for sharing this data. But we can see the households that are doing it the toughest. Right, so we can see there's you know 25 to 29 year olds higher rents or higher mortgage costs, 30 to 34 year olds also running families, 35 to 39 year olds significant, and you know 40 to 44 year olds. So there's this cluster that we're seeing here that you know they've got all of these additional costs: education, uh, mortgages, uh, running their families, uh, transportation. All of those are betting into lower spending in those areas. Now the flip side of that is all the retirees who are getting access to their cash. Um, They've got lump sum super access. They're usually debt-free in terms of the mortgages they have. And so they've got money sitting in term deposits. They're getting uh, dividend payments. They're they're spending and they're just living the life. And and obviously COVID locked them down for a couple of years. So they're back on the spending treadmill. And so they, along with the government, are doing some of the, the, you know, the hard, uh, you know, or negative work compared to what the RBH is trying to do from a monetary policy point of view, to try and slow things down. So it really is, you know, a complete dichotomy in terms of what's happening with that younger generation and, and their impact on spending versus obviously that older generation who are, who are, who are basically flush with cash. Mm-hmm. And it's what we keep hearing at the moment is the argument around what we've just gone through, what we've seen from the RBA is the impact of monetary policy as it once was to now is clearly different. As Ben's spoken to you many, many times on all of his different forums, we do have a third that have a mortgage, a third that rent, and a third that own their property outright. And if you've got that larger population that aren't really impacted by tightening rates because they don't have exposure to some form of lending, then away they can go. Not only that, as Ben also just highlighted, they're more likely to be the creditors. They're not the debitors. They're the ones that are actually giving the banks the money through term deposits and the like. So every time rates go up, they get more money because they obviously get more money from the bank or from whatever institution they're invested in. So this is the catch that also has been highlighted right now is that is monetary policy as effective as it once was? The argument is yes. It's just much more disproportional than it used to be. And that is what the problem is right now. And again, the fight that will be between the generations for always for millennia to come. I understand that. But it is becoming more acute than usual that the difference between the older and the younger is larger, not because of necessarily wealth generational issues, but because of their different stages of life and their different exposures to the economic mechanisms that we all have. And then there's obviously, you know, the one that I also missed in that conversation is the downsizers who are cashing in on their principal yeah. place of residence home, paying no capital gains tax, and another way of getting flush with cash. And there, you know, there's 25% of most purchases are paid in cash. And they've got extra hundreds of thousands of dollars that they can either push through their super or basically get out there and buy their caravan four-wheel drive and get going yep. in terms of how the world looks. So it, it very much is an interesting story in terms of, you know, a lovely place for the wealth creation that's occurred for that generation, those baby boomers. There's no doubt um, that they've, you know, they've helped this nation become super prosperous, uh, prosperous and, and also very, you know, economically relevant 
uh, in terms of you know the the living standards and prosperity that this nation's enjoyed pretty much over the last fifty years as they've grown and now are hitting the retirement um, sort of circuit. So that is an interesting story, and I think there's there's more to be said in that particular thing as well as obviously the wealth transfer that we know is going to happen over the course of the next five to ten years. Now, let's do a quick snapshot on the business data before we move into the property story. We saw that the National Australia Bank, the NAB Business Confidence Index was up to a reading of one in March from a flat reading or zero reading in February. Figures stayed below its long run average with sentiment mainly improving in retail, construction and transport. Meanwhile, business conditions were little changed, a reading of nine versus 10 in February as, as, as sales at 14 and employment at six was steady while profitability fell uh, to, to a reading of six versus 10. So there is tension on price here. And so they want to pass on these costs. So we've got to basically not allow them to do that by not buying their goods and be really careful about our spending decisions. Forward orders were also negative at negative 0.1 versus negative 0.3. Uh, capacity utilisation eased slightly at 83.2% versus 83.4%. Labor cost di uh, growth dipped to a reading of 1.6% in the quarter, equivalent terms of a prior 2%. Purchase cost growth slowed to a reading of 1.4 from 1.8. Retail price growth edged down to 1.3% from 1.4. Now, Alan Oster, I really you know enjoy his commentary, but this the, he's the chief economist of NAB, and he said, cost pressures remain elevated, but have eased a little more but retail price growth remains elevated again. So he's got this whole combination of cost elevation moving through to uh, growth remains elevated. He went on to say, fundamentally, this aligns with our expectations that progress on bringing inflation back to target will be gradual uh, because obviously, you know, the, the activity and the confidence that the business sector has. So some, some interesting data there to look at also, isn't there, Evan? Yeah, and I'm not going to add much more to what Alan said because it perfectly sums it up that at the moment, the consumer, the, whoever the business is selling to, whether it's a good or a service, is still willing to take that price. Yeah. So they're not having to discount. And until that, in my view, changes, and that's what Alan's alluding to there, then we're going to have this problem around this gradual, you know, longer term, slow burn to getting inflation back to target. Okay, so now let's turn our attention to property uh, as we make this run home. And so there's a few things we always want to look at. We want to look at lending um, because obviously that indicates demand and activity. We want to look at building approvals and then we want to look at the ultimate, you know, what's happening with prices for both houses and also for rent. So let's start also with the home lending activity and what we saw from the ABS, that the value of new home lending for owner-occupied homes in Australia grew by 2.8% month on month. Um, to 17.48 billion in March. And that's easily exceeding market forecasts of a 1% growth and accelerated from the marginally revised 1.5% rise in the prior month. Now, the purchase of existing dwellings also accelerated 3.5% versus 4.1%, while construction of dwellings rebounded 3.2% versus negative 1.7%. So there is some movement in construction. However, the purchase of newly erected dwellings fell 1.5% after increasing 6.2% previously. Now that can that can bounce up and down a little bit there. That's that's all about you know what's happening weather-wise and, and the completions that are going on. Now this is where it becomes really interesting. Let's have a look at this around the around the ground. Uh, geographically, we saw new home loans increase in most states or territories. New South Wales, 2.4% up, Victoria, 2% up. Queensland, strong, 5.6% up. South Australia, 2.8%. Western Australia, very strong, 6.3%. Tasmania, small market, so you get these fluctuations, but 17.8% up. And the Northern Territory, 136 again, uh, you know, very small market. Now, conversely, we saw a plunge of 19.2% in the ACT. Now, on an annualised basis, the value of new home loans has jumped by 11.4%. Uh, so, some real activity, and we're seeing that in our business in terms of the number of people who are actively looking. In terms of building approvals, this is the biggest headache for the government with their, their targets around you know this big build program that they want to go on in terms of building new houses. So we saw the ABS report that building permits year on year in Australia decreased by 2.2% in March from negative 5.3% in February. So there is 
um, you know, a slight improvement in terms of month on month approvals. Remembering again, this jumps around a lot. Seasonally adjusted estimate for total dwellings approved increased by 1.9% month on month to 12,947 units in March, reversing the upwardly revised 0.9% fall in February, but missing market expectations of a 3% gain. In terms of the markets, the strongest growth in five months with private sector houses, 3.8% up. Private sector dwellings excluding houses, 3.6%, uh, you know, in terms of boasting, uh, posting strong gains. In terms of geographical area, this is where it kits down to what's going on. So we saw dwelling activity in terms of approvals, Victoria up 3.2%, West Australia 1.5%, and falling in Tasmania, negative 18.1%, South Australia negative 7%, Queensland negative 52 and New South Wales negative 2.1%. But again, those numbers do jump around. Okay, moving along to the Core Logic's monthly hedonic home value index. And what did we learn from our good friends at Core Logic? We saw that in terms of the April results, Sydney was up by 0.4 of 1% for the month of April. Melbourne was negative, it fell by 0.1 of 1%. Brisbane was up by 0.9 of 1%. Adelaide was up 1.3%. Perth was up very strong 2% in the month. Hobart was 0.3 of 1% higher. Darwin 0.6 of 1% higher and Canberra 0.2 of 1% higher. So the only falling market across the country is the Melbourne property market. So combined capital cities, we saw a 0.6 of 1% gain and combined regions, we saw a 0.8 of 1% gain. So nationally, a 0.6 gain. So some of the broader observations here, this is the classic case of markets within markets. So there's certain markets across the country that are doing really, really well. It's good to see also some of those regional markets. Now, that's really excluding the Victorian data. So some of the Victorian markets are quite sluggish at the moment regionally, as well as obviously Melbourne are suffering from headwinds around government policy and regulations that are going on down here. So you can really see, you know, the markets are, are definitely starting to separate in terms of their activity. And, and it still remains you know, a, a strong supply versus demand story. So demand is definitely exceeding supply in most of those markets. So we see, you know, Perth's flying, Brisbane, Adelaide, Adelaide, very strong. Sydney, Darwin, Canberra are also solid. Uh, Melbourne is, you know, sorry, Hobart's doing okay. And Melbourne really is the underperforming market uh, based on their economic management down here in Victoria. Um, again, what I was mentioning before, it's good to see in terms of from a regional point of view, excluding Victoria, that the regional market combined uh, was up 2.1% over the uh, the quarterly period. So um, that is also telling us a story around most likely affordability. Uh, you know, we are definitely seeing um, a bit of movement around migration, interstate migration away from Melbourne and also away from Sydney into those more affordable markets as we look at that. Now, let's turn our attention to the rental growth story. And I'll, I'll get your opinion on this uh, in a minute, Evan, in terms of what did we see? So yesterday, CoreLogic released a report that says, you know, for the first time, um, rents, weekly household median rents across the country have hit a peak at $627 um, in terms of that. So let's just quickly have a look for those who are on the pod. Um, I'll also read them out. So we see Sydney's median weekly rent is $770, Melbourne's $589. Now, I want you to hold that figure in your head. Uh, Brisbane is 400 and, and sorry 649 Adelaide is 589 Perth is 669 Hobart is 547 Darwin is 617 Canberra is 674 so combined capitals really doesn't mean much but 659 combined regions 540 uh, and the national is the reading I just gave you before which is 627. Now, this is where I want to talk about. So Perth, strongest market in terms of rental increases, 13.6%. Um, I expect that they will lose their title to Melbourne, um, which is coming in number two at 9.6% in price growth, because I've been telling you the story about what's been happening in Melbourne. There's an exodus of rental supply in Victoria and in Melbourne specifically. So we're down around 11,700 rental properties than where we were uh, basically three months ago uh, over the year, year on year results. So that's got to be concerning and, and obviously that's going to put pressure on it. And that's why it's so interesting because if you look at Melbourne compared to say Brisbane and also Perth, so you've got Melbourne um, with a sort of, you know, a median house price of 942,000, 
but their rent's only 589. You've got Perth with a median house price of 754,000, but rented only 669. And you've got Brisbane with a median house price 920 with rent at 649. So effectively, you've got a 10% discount on rents uh, in Melbourne compared to Brisbane and a 14% discount in terms of rents compared to Perth. So with this shortage of supply, I have no doubt, and obviously the land tax that's been introduced, which we're calling a tenancy tax, I have no doubt in my mind that Melbourne is going to see the strongest rental growth over the course of the next six to 12 months, purely based on the fact of there is just no new supply. Investors are moving across to the West and also Adelaide, Southeast Queensland still remain very strong investor markets. Um, again, Perth and Western Australia strategically brilliant by their, uh, their parliamentarians over there to not introduce uh, the no clause uh, eviction notices. So that's attracted you know tens of billions of dollars of investment over into that particular market as well. And from a price point, relatively affordable and good yields. So one, when I see, and I think longer term, you know, sort of the next decade or beyond, um, Melbourne's going to represent excellent value. But right now, um, you know, you've got to be basically buying against the trend um, where all the demand is is effectively heading over into the Western and also Brisbane markets and Adelaide markets at the moment. So that just sort of gives you a bit of an idea. Have you got a, a view on that, Evan? No, again, the term that you always use is business owners, right? So if you are to imp impact business owners with higher taxation and higher changes in that space, you are going to have to see that surely but surely pass through. So on to your thesis, which is I completely agree with with regards to Melbourne, that business owner, that, that, that landlord is going to have to pass those costs through. And it is unsustainable to have a yield that's below 2%, which is what you've just highlighted as well. Most properties at the moment are below a yield that is sustainable. So the business owner, that small player, is going to have to raise rents just because, not just the fact that they are clearly at a discount to regional peers, which they should be at or above. Let's also be honest, particularly around Brisbane and Adelaide with the population that Melbourne has over those two. So that that is, you know, the thesis is absolutely pretty clear. And then you've got the business impact that comes with, with having higher levels of taxation. Yeah, and I think if we do tell a story over time that if interest rates do go up a little bit higher, there will be an insular um, sort of protection mechanism because of the supply constraints versus the demand. I yeah. would have thought if we were in a normal balanced market and interest rates were going higher, we would see property prices decline further than what they have. And in fact, as we know, they're obviously growing when interest rates have moved up as high as they have. So that's an interesting story. All right, let's, um, let's now summarise um, basically what we've talked about today from an economic point of view. Um, we've really honed in on the domestic-driven uh, inflation story, which is that sticky uh, inflation. So that services inflation, non-tradables that Evan talked about there. We also wanted to focus in in terms of, you know, our prediction around where we think the cash rate will go. Um, it's moved our estimate in terms of, you know, when that first rate cut will happen. So uh, my prediction was August. Uh, Evans was September. We're now potentially seeing that later this year or potentially in the new year. Now, again, what's going to inform that is really the the, the month on month, but really the quarter on quarter um, inflation data that we're going to see in June. That's going to dictate basically, you know, where the RBA heads from from, from there uh, in terms of what that looks like. From a property point of view, I'll just continue to keep reminding you know property investors are still doing it tough. There's lots of costs. Namely, we've talked about those interest rates. We've talked about the insurance premiums, um, the tax and charges, the, comp the increased compliance costs that are all coming into that particular space. And that's ultimately leading to a negative outcome for both the, the, the small business owner, but also the tenant that, uh, that they want to have quiet um, and safe enjoyment of those properties as well. So um, they're my final words, Evan. Something from you for your final word? Yeah, so for me now, it's all about August. And why do I highlight that? Ben just pointed out, you know, the June quarterly numbers, we will get that inflation read in August. And that's what will therefore inform our view around what happens for the rest of the year, because half a year's worth of inflation, the RBA will have a very good understanding then of where things are going. So that is why now that month is going to be absolutely core to everything for the rest of this year, because we will get so much data from the second quarter of this calendar year. And that's where we now need to focus our attention in terms of what will happen for the rest of 24, but also into 2025.
Well said, mate. And obviously, as you said earlier, we've got the federal budget coming up. So this is obviously fiscal policy. So what is the government going to do? Um, you know, they they are torn. They've got an election that they want to rewin. So they're going to probably throw a bit of cash at it, which is stimulatory, which is going to be challenging against inflation. So you're going to do a special uh, budget yeah. update um, next week. So we'll, you know, keep an eye and an ear out for that. Um, in terms of those updates, and we'll be back. So remember that the RBA updates now every six or so weeks, um, so down to eight times a year. So we'll be back uh, when the next RBA announcement, which is in June, yep. um, for our next update for that. Until next time, I'll always remember that knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. And bye for now, folks. <laughs>